Welcome everyone to Story Trading. Got a special presentation here. We have the CEO of Clearfield, Sherry Baranek, here with us uh, for some housekeeping notes. Uh, disclaimer: Story Trading is not an investment advisor. Investing securities involves significant risk of loss. We're recording this presentation. It will be provided exclusively for Story Trading members for a period of time, and then next week at some point we'll post this up on YouTube. Now, for those of you who are not familiar. Just a quick 30 second explanation about what story trading is, and then we'll take it from there. It's not easy to understand why stocks go up and down, but even in volatile markets, there's always a discoverable and logical reason behind price action. Story trading is a social investing community of investors who share information to uncover the hidden stories behind the trade through the four pillars of fundamentals, catalyst, sentiment, and technicals. All price action can be understood through the lens of these pillars, allowing for a holistic view that empowers better decision making. Only by understanding markets can you beat them. Join our community today and start making sense of markets. All right. So that's what story trading is about through uh, the research we do here. There's the fundamental pillar. There's four pillars we talked about. Interviewing CEOs helps us understand what the business is doing, what their profitability is, what their future prospects are. It helps us also understand a little bit about sentiment. So uh, Sherry Baranek, I just want to point out, uh, she was with us. I want to big, give a big thank you to Gateway IR because they actually reached out to us first. That's what we, how we learned about this company. Uh, they reached out to us uh, June 30th. Uh, she came, gave a pre presentation to us. The stock was not on our radar at all. And it's been one of the best performing, if not maybe the best performing stock, well, no, besides AIR, second best performing stock uh, in their community, uh, up 178% since June 30th. It was $37.45 at the time. So number one, big thank you to Gateway IR for reaching out to us. Number two, thank you for Cherry for executing and doing a great job with the company. And number three, uh, Chris Harbert uh, in our community, you'll, I'll introduce him in a second. Big thank you for him to him. For staying on top of this opportunity and making sure everyone in the community was up to speed on what was going on. Now, quickly before I bring on Sherry, I just want to show everyone here's the chart. And we talked about, you know, understanding, you know, why does it go up and down and everything like that. And as we get into this, just want to remind people, it's really about those four pillars, fundamentals, sentiment, catalyst, and technical. So for, with that, let's get started. Uh, Sherry, welcome to the program. So nice to have you back uh, since uh, June 2021. It's been awesome. Yeah, well, thank you for the opportunity to come on back um, and uh, tell you a little bit more about what's all been happening in, in the world of fiber management and fiber connectivity. Awesome, that's great. Um, if we could get started, give you an opportunity to just speak five minutes, prepared remarks, whatever you want to say, update on the company, and then we'll go into a discussion led by myself and Chris Tarbert. Uh, here, who's part of the community as well. So take it away for five minutes, Sherry. Thanks. Yeah, well, Clearfield was founded in 2008 uh, with the mission and values to be able to enable the lifestyle that better broadband provides. Because we felt that everyone in the country, you know, deserved that opportunity, you know, to be able to have, you know, to be able to live, work, and play from their home and business, you know, at well, you know, as to the connectivity requirements that were put in place. But what we found 14 years ago was that the big guys were providing products to other big guys, you know, like Verizon and AT&T, and hadn't identified the fact that deploying fiber optic communications in other markets, perhaps smaller markets, require different products. And so in the last 14 years, we went from startup and bootstrapped ourselves from originally a, a stock price of 86 cents and a market cap of $10 million uh, to today uh, a stock price that I think is hovering around $104 uh, and a market cap of $1.4 billion. Um, and more excitedly, you know, we have deployed millions of ports of connectivity across the country. What the product line does is, is protect fiber as it moves from the central office to the home or business. The, um, and we do that in a way that is unique in that it allows our service provider customers to align their capital equipment expenditures alongside their subscriber take rates. And that modularity, the um, scalability, really makes a difference when cash flow is, is king. 
and more importantly, provides a mechanism by which for that service provider to be the first fiber in. Because we found during COVID, right, that fiber was not, or broadband was not a choice or a need. It was absolutely a complete requirement for our customers and for ourselves as a community. Yeah, so we grew as a company uh, about 15% compounded annual uh, for about 12 years. And in the last two years post-COVID or throughout COVID, about a 70% uh, compounded annual growth rate over the last two years. In fact, finishing fiscal year 22 in September of this year uh, at a 91% growth rate over last year. Um, the um, producing that in a way because our customers uh, know that they need a labor light solution. We reduce the amount of labor that's required, and we have found that to be a very sustainable, you know, competitive advantage. The um, I like to be able to talk uh, to investors to be able to say our business is about allowing our customers to make money and to make money in a way that makes their customers happy. Um, and our market is such that, you know, we are, um, we're taking a lot of share because of our focus and we see long-term a significant amount of opportunity for ourselves. Uh, we released numbers and a forecast for fiscal year, uh, 20, uh, excuse me, for 23, we're continuing our growth at another 40 to 45%. The, um, and we have identified, uh, while we don't give guidance uh, for uh, profitability, we finished the year out at you know, about 18.5% net income. And uh, we're extremely proud of that type of, um, of solution, that type of opportunity to make a return on our, our investment. Uh, and uh, and we look forward to telling you about a lot more. But I think it's probably easier to do that um, in more of a dialogue um, with Chris. And um, uh, then I can pontificate and tell the story of Clearfield, which is probably something that I uh, love to do more than anything else in the world. Awesome. That's a great overview, Sherry. Really appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to just ask two questions and I'll turn it over to Chris. First question is, well, we didn't have an offering yesterday, $120 million. I'm sure you'll get more into the, the weeds of that with, with Chris. I just have one question about the pricing. Um, uh, you know, I don't know the stock was $93 before a great earnings report ran up to 135. And then we see this, the offering price at a hundred dollars and, um, Hey, you, you're doing a great job executing. I don't mean to be, uh, criticizing or anything, but I just wonder how it works. You know, like, why couldn't you get better pricing? <laughs> well, you know, the, um, it's not about the price on a given certain day. And it's, and it's certainly about the long-term uh, orientation that everybody wants to make money. Um, our, our, our trailing 30 day average, you know, was $110, which is what, where we were, tra where, where we were trading yesterday. Um, you know, certainly it was a negative position, uh, in the marketplace the last couple of days. The, um, but we really looked at it with the advice of counsel, um, that we wanted to improve the type of, uh, of investor that we had within the um, improve is right, not the wrong word, right word, enhance the types of investors that we were working with and providing an opportunity for the institutional investors to be a bigger part of what we were doing um, and really protecting the company and protecting our investors to have a product um, at a, a, a having the liquidity levels to ensure that we were a more stable product offering. Um, and so uh, we think that we came away in a really good place. Uh, we traded really well today, um, you know, almost a million shares. And um, uh, I think we'll have a, an opportunity to continue to raise, uh, increase our share price moving forward. Awesome. That sounds good. So, uh, all right, here is my final question before I turn it over to Chris. Just going to share my screen here. I don't know if you saw this. There was a, a representative, Thomas Massey, Kentucky, it looks like. I don't know if you saw this tweet. Did you see it? Mm -hmm. It I says, mm -hmm. uh, oh, you did. Okay, great. I just lost half of my earpiece. But um, let me, for those who are not familiar, it says Starlink is on the verge of making 90% of government finance rural internet initiatives obsolete. Most people don't understand how revolutionary Starlink internet service is. I predict it will double rural land values in, in the United States. 29,000 likes. So it got uh, spread around a little bit and perhaps, I don't know, maybe impacted your stock. So just wanted to give a chance to respond to that. 
You think um, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, to be <laughs> um, and so one of the things we often found is, you know, is uh, is government, uh, government or non-government individuals. You can you can get a bit of information and then you can um, extend it into um, assumptions that are not accurate. You know, Starlink is a really good product. I have one. The, um, I have it on my RV. It's meant for me to be able to have niche solutions in different places. So when we are traveling into an environment where the you know where there is no other level of connectivity, you know it's a great option for us to continue to be working from anywhere if no one else is around. The, um, because Starlink is a shared service. It's similar to a standpoint, you know, of a hybrid fiber coax environment, because the more users that are on that Starlink the con connection, the lower the performance goes, you know, on an ongoing basis. So it is not a solution for a dense environment, and it's not a solution uh, for an environment in which there's going to be a high level of users for an uh, ongoing basis. You know, in fact, in the broadband programs, the, um, you know, Starlink, uh, there's a program called called ARDOF and Starlink won initially, there was uh, the ARDOF program for unserved markets was to award $10 billion. And Starlink was awarded, you know, a significant chunk of that, you know, a little over a billion dollars. But when they came to actually prove the performance threshold that they bid within the auction, they failed and they were not allowed to, to receive that funding. So, you know, the proof is in the pudding and I just have not seen uh, them make any good pudding. Okay. Great. So I'll leave it at that. Um, uh, I want to introduce Chris Tarbert. Uh, Chris, you there? Yep, I'm here. Awesome. Chris has been an active member of our community, and he has been on top of Clearfield. He's been ban ban pounding the table for, I don't know, most of 2022, uh, letting us know it's a great investment. So he's been a great uh, asset to us in the community. So Chris uh, has prepared a whole bunch of questions. I'm going to let him take it away from here. Thanks, Ben. And uh, good to see you again, Sherry. And thanks to you and Matt for uh, allowing us to ha have this opportunity, uh, especially with the timing of the secondary. So mm -hmm. I'm going to go back to that for a second. Um, can you walk us through sort of the rationale behind the secondary versus, say, extending you know, the line of credit you have, which you know I think still has another 18 million on it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we, I don't think it's an either or. Um, you know, we have grown to an environment of, you know, over the last, you know, last two years, gone from less than 100 million in revenue to this year, you know, um, getting approaching 300 million dollars. Yeah, and at that rate of growth, you know, we were in a position that we couldn't continually internally fund the company as we had been previously. The um, you know, up until 2022, this was an entirely bootstrap company. No public money had, had ever been raised. Because you know, when we started in, in 2007, you know, we were uh, kind of an offshoot of uh, a public company that had raised $40 million in the dot-com market, but unfortunately never uh, made any profit. So when we started, um, we had $4 million in cash. Uh, we had $36 million worth of NOLs and an idea. So over those 14 years, we you know, got ourselves in a position the old-fashioned way. We earned it, built a really strong balance sheet. But in the two years where we've grown so rapidly, you know, we've consumed a lot of our cash. We made $50 million last year and did convert a lot of it uh, into inventory to ensure that we can continue to grow um, and continue to provide the resources that our customers require. When we had the opportunity to acquire Nestor earlier this year, uh, that put us in a position where debt financing was, a, was appropriate because we had an opportunity and we needed to make that happen. The, um, but there's all, in our, our world, there's a standpoint that says, let's make sure that we can go after an RFP and the largest companies in the world are going to be comfortable that we're going to be able to execute. The, um, and so while our product line and our company has been focused on community broadband and some sm more smaller opportunities, we also know that we can scale to the, those larger companies and larger requirements. So uh, we felt it was best for us to be in a position where we had uh, a full, to a full tool, ch tool chest. Um, you could tell that I've, uh, I had 29 meetings in two days. <laughs> my, uh, my mouth is a little twisted today. Um, uh, but it gives us a really good foundation. And, you know, we have been uh, very, um, I, I think, very ca cautious stewards of our money uh, and will continue to to be equally cautious, to be disciplined as to how we're going to use, you know, the money associated with it. But the biggest 
uh, differentiation between Clearfield and our competitors beyond our product line is the culture of the company, which is fast, it's quick, and we can pivot when necessary. Uh, and the raises is, is really going to allow help us do that. So was there any specific requirements in the RFPs or from the tier one carriers or the wireless carriers that said that they wanted you to have X amount of money on the balance sheet? Or was it just in your mind, more of a comfort level that you had the uh, capacity mm -hmm. to scale? The, um, it, it, no, there was no specific number um, from anything else. It was we were looking at our position, the rate of growth that we wanted, that we believe we can continue to grow with, and be making sure that we had you know the checkbook, the credit card, and the um, and the and the balance sheet uh, to be able to move forward. Okay, well that's sort of segues into my next question. So I know in the last earnings call you talked about you know, you're aggressively working to increase capacity as fast as possible. You, you made some fleeting comments about potentially building up capacity in Finland as well. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk about, you know, at least with Minnesota and Mexico, sort of what your max capacity is there? Can it handle, say, you know, the 400 or close to 400 million target you have for 2023? And at, at what point would you actually need to increase mm -hmm. capacity at those facilities? Right. The, uh, the, um, yeah, the, our company is what I would call virtually integrated rather than vertically integrated. And we did that when we started because as a small company, we just didn't have the wherewithal um, by which to you know, go out and, um, and spend the money and be able to actually you know, do all these different elements. Um, and with it, have all the overhead that comes from being able to do everything internally. So when we uh, triple the size of our footprint in Mexico last year and double the footprint in the U.S. market, we really wanted to look long term as to how do we put ourselves in a position that we can continue to grow. It's not fun to move, although we're pretty good at it, <laughs> um, but then also leverage our supply chain partners so that we were not the only ones adding overhead. <laughs> the, um, our, there's, it's difficult to put a number on, on what that footprint allows because it's product specific. Um, and it also is a standpoint as to how much we're going to uh, be able to bring on additional what I call contract cabinet centers. Um, our cabinet centers are, are not traditional contract manufacturing sites, but instead they are our suppliers that are dedicated to our work. And we have Clearfield quality employees on site to ensure that they meet our specs. <clears throat> and so we don't have to necessarily, you know, just go after square footage in order to be able to grow the business. So, you know, I am, uh, I am very comfortable with our forecast for fiscal year, you know, 23 with the footprint we have um, and, you know, for, you know, more than one year beyond. Um, and then we can add space um, as, as, as necessary and or potentially proactively uh, for the right opportunity. Um, um, I, I think the one of the things that we demonstrated last year was, you know, when we gave our original forecast in the fall um, of 20, um, of, of 21, the, we were building those facilities and we had targeted March for them to come online. <clears throat> the, um, uh, and then we had to be able to hire hundreds of people and then be able to train them to be effective. So when we looked at the numbers for the year, we had to, you know, discount quite a bit of the opportunity as to whether or not we truly were going to be able to execute. Um, and I can tell you, I could not have, I mean, it, it surpassed, you know, our wildest expectations and the ability to execute has, has been phenomenal at every level. And my team has been um, laser focused on being able to make this work. The, um, as we move forward on that, um, we are uh, we're building the facility in Mexico in quadrants uh, for fiber termination. Uh, we're on our third quadrant, so that allows us to control overhead as well as scale um, as our business scales. We're going to bring the uh, an additional enhancing our capacity for optical cable manufacturing by bringing a new line into the Mexican facility, and there's room for three more. So you know we've got a, we're in a pretty good place to continue to grow. Uh, the, the Nestor environment is a little tighter. Um, they were they were in an environment that um, didn't have a, an organizational infrastructure or a, a, a ownership structure that really encouraged growth. They were more about a return on an equity position from the original lending group. Uh, and we're really excited about giving them some open arms, um, not, not an open checkbook, but a means by which to look at how do we best grow the organization. And that's an amazing team. Um, we're looking at at, um, some additional capex there for microduct manufacturing. Um, we also have a plant 
uh, a team that is in Estonia, the um, that provides some low cost labor options. Um, so there's a lot, lo lot of good things available to us. Not, uh, I would say, very multifaceted rather than single focused. Okay, I'm going I'm to table sort of the Nestor opportunity in Europe for a second, but I did want to talk about, and maybe this is part of the third quadrant or fourth quadrant, is bringing the sort of the Nestor product line, the drop cables, et cetera, the production of that from Finland over to Mexico. Um, I think you talked about that's probably like a six to 12 month project. I, obviously, I think there's, there's going to be some margin improvements in terms of saving on shipping and et cetera. Can you, can you discuss that a little bit and what that brings to you? Yeah, well, the first stage is to enhance capacity. And so uh, we're going to bring a new line, you know, into Mexico. And uh, the goal there, you're right, was to be able to not have the logistical nightmare um, of shipping product, you know, from Finland to the U.S. and then terminating it for final uh, requirement. And so the, inter the integration of that new line um, into Mexico will allow us to lean out the process and terminate uh, cable assemblies, you know, right in step with that manufacturing line. The um, our our frame of reference, you know, that's all about Field Shield, uh, and you know, Field Shield was designed by Clearfield, but then manufactured by Nestor. Now bringing, excuse me, that manufacturing capability into Mexico uh, will allow us to bring probably new innovation, you know, to what we're doing and extending different kinds of materials and um, and fiber counts into our world, um, but not at the expense uh, of what we're doing in Finland. Uh, we think that we'll be able to use some of that additional capacity in Finland for growth there. So um, it's not, um, it, it, yes, it will be a labor or a cost savings, but I would um, I would not encourage you to look at this as being a, a um, gross profit improvement in the short term. Um, what we're really looking to do is to position the company to ensure that we have the wherewithal to meet price points as we move forward. Now, does this, does this timing sort of run in line with your expectations that your opportunities for you know, connecting homes at a higher revenue per home versus homes past? Absolutely. And that, you know, we are typically known, um, for, you know, as a cabinet company and more outside plant in regard to passing homes. And as you know, our revenue opportunity per home past, you know, is around $50. Uh, but our opportunity for homes connected, you know, averages up to $250 for every home. And today the take rate, I um, mean, uh, it's about 44%, uh, I think is what the industry has talked about. Um, so there's a significant opportunity in front of us to connect the homes that we have passed, you know, with our partners, um, our, our service provider customers. The um, One of our strongest initiatives this year is uh, really cre creating portfolio customers that use our product on an end-to-end -end basis so they can uh, recognize the labor savings that are that are associated with it. You know, we've done studies with our service provider customers. The um, uh, Last year, in fact, there was a, a tier two company that wasn't able to get the product from one of our competitors, and, and they wanted us to fill in on capacity. I said, you know, I have so much business. Um, honestly, I don't want your business unless it's sticky, unless you're going to stay with me. Um, because, But I want to earn it. I'm not just going to ask for your business. And so they did a labor study and found that they could pass twice as many homes using our product than the incumbent that they were using before, which really put us in a position of a passing of the home leader. And subsequently, we did studies about our connection solutions, and we found through our service provider studies that were done on site with their engineers that it took 38% less labor to use our products than a competing solution that was not plug and play. So that combined is really giving us this new, big new opportunity moving forward and why we wanted to ensure Field Shield um, was close to our manufacturing facilities and we could really run with it. Do you see like 2024, 2025 sort of being the inflection point where, you, where you're starting to see more business from, from connecting homes versus passing homes? Yes, um, um, I think the, that will actually uh, align really closely with where I think the government funding is and where the mar overall market is going to uh, really take off. Right. Um, you, know, you know, it's, um, you know, Give, taking a step back on some of those government funding initiatives, you know, I've talked a little bit about the ARDOF dollars and, and how uh, they made some mistakes and how that was awarded um, under the BEAD, pro but under the BEAD program, they're doing a better job, I think. Um, it's taking, it's, unfortunately, it's going to take a while. You know, the BEAD program is $100 billion, uh, about half of it going into CapEx, about half of it going into subsidies so that the consumer um, can improve their take rates. 
the MNS take rates, you know, are enhanced through those programs. Clearfield's in a really great position to take advantage um, because we believe those unserved and underserved communities that have, are in the census blocks that were released last week um, are exactly in our sweet spot, you know, in the community broadband markets that we serve. The, um, so with the, the maps released last week, they've got six months by which to go through uh, the review to identify that they, you know, they're approved. And then the states will start to allocate where that money will be deployed. So, you know, late uh, next summer, it was, we'll start to see some of that money. And then it'll be 24, 25, 26 as part of that, you know, five-year program um, that this market is really going to be strong. That's why we have to be so focused on labor. Do you, do you all right, so staying on that same vein, um, when the RDOF feed and the other federal programs really start to kick in, do you still see sort of the growth rate in, in, in your organic sort of capacity being the same, or are you going to start to see a shift? Yeah, well, you know, our um, organic is difficult to, um, to define these days because community broadband is changing. You know, when we started as a company, community broadband, and we have defined community broadband is when a service provider is serving the community in which the, uh, is making the decision to deploy in, in the communities in which they live. The um, and so uh, community broadband used to be a tier three telephone company only, right? It's companies like Sure West Communications or Nuvera or Vermont Telephone. Now, community broadband is a series of utilities and municipalities, rural electrical co ops that are saying, if if, the, if no one else is going to serve the needs of my community, I have the wherewithal because, you know, I have right away, I have a customer service team, I have a billing methodology. And so I'll take the initiative either on my own or through a public-private partnership. So I think those V dollars will be part of all of community broadband. Um, and, and I think Clearfield will be by our sales structure, in a, which is distributed and remote to those facilities that is teamed with a very strong technical support group, which I call my smart guys, um, that will continue to, to work there and grow with it and, and, and be a reference point. It's like, you know, when, um, when New Alm Telephone deploys in Minnesota, the, um, you know, the, the guys who run New Alm Telephone are talking to the guys who run Paul Bunyan Telephone, you know, 50 miles away, um, and they're not competing with each other they're looking at the fastest way to deploy um, and oftentimes the referrals are what get us the strongest business in this space the um, and so as a result today we have about 1200 customers uh, about half of those customers um, excuse me, half of our business goes through distribution, about a thousand of those customers. Then 200 customers, which represent the other 50% of our business, go direct. Um, but all of those customers are serviced by our technical team, and it's, tip it's just the financial relationship that the distributor would own. Okay, Ben's got a question about government funding, but, but I wanted to ask one world quick question. I don't know if you've published it anywhere, but and can you share what you think your sort of your market penetration is in community broadband? Are you looking at a sort of a 70, 75 percent market share? The, uh, uh, yeah, there hasn't been an independent study, so it's a guess. Um, but Ryan uh, Coons at Needham identified he felt that we were about a 50 percent share. Okay. Um, and so and I think what uh, and that, that number can go in a lot of different directions. But I think what is more telling is that the um, the Fiber Broadband Association has has indicated that the market is growing at about 13 percent for the numbers of homes passed and connected. And Clearfield grew 91 percent last year. The uh, yes. we're taking share somewhere. That's right. the, that means we're going to continue. I think why we're growing and why we will continue to grow. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Ben uh, for some government funding questions. Ben, yeah, um, thanks. Can you just the process of the government subsidies? Uh, do you get paid by the government, or do your customers get paid? How how do you see the benefit of that? So the customer, so our service provider customers would be the ones that would submit applications for government funding. So we do, we don't get the government funding directly, but our service providers would re could receive it or could apply for it. Awesome. And are you able to characterize? And I, I don't know how you would even know this, uh, but are you able to know like what percent of your revenue? benefited from a uh, government funding? Yeah, it's only an estimate because of the fact that um, so much of it goes through distribution. The, um, but um, on our direct business, um, we think it's about 5%. It's really low yet. It's very early. Okay, cool. Thanks. Chris, back to you. Yeah, this might be a, a real specific question. Um, in terms of your backlog, can you discuss sort of sort of the 
composite of that between sort of community broadband and and the larger tier ones? I mean, are the are the tier ones sort of more playing the long game and they're they're used to placing orders, you know, that may you know maybe structured you know a year two years out versus mm -hmm. the community broadband mm -hmm. where they may want you know your your historical tw twelve week or even. Yeah tighter oh, turnaround oh, times? Well, we used to deliver product in 12 days right. um, before the pandemic, but um, uh, the, the the backlog is actually um, you know distributed pretty fairly across the entire um, uh, uh, customer base, The um, but there is two different kinds of backlog. There is what I would call FIFO backlog and schedule backlog. And so the FIFO backlog, as it you know, as it sounds, is a first in, first out approach. The um, and that used to be the majority of our business. The um, but in the quarter ending in um, June, you know, I said that about seventy five percent of our business would ship in the next um, six months, and then the quarter ending in September, it was down to, to you know two thirds. And so more and more of our customers are looking in that scheduled environment and really helping us help them so that they can have a long-term plan about what they're where they're going. Now, uh, they're not necessarily larger, but they are perhaps more sophisticated or more experienced in their deployment. Um, and so um, these are companies that have typically done fiber before and can uh, are doing a better job of aligning their labor requirements with the um, their capital equipment. Uh, expenditures. Yeah, that was going to be sort of be my next question is what, what's the stacking solution for not only your customers, but for you in terms of mm -hmm. able to handle this, this, you know, massive amount of growth. The, uh, well, I'm very proud of our our, um, our hiring teams, um, both in the U.S. as well as in the Mexican plant, uh, in that we are we are close to 800 people now in our Mexican plant, which is more than double where we were a year ago, and we're continuing to to look at um, at that facility and how to be able to continue to to expand, you know, another 50 percent over the course of the next year. Um, so I think we're doing a pretty good job of knowing. Um, uh, that it's not just about money, it's about how you treat people, it's about providing um, resources um, th that are appreciated. We have breakfast every morning, we have lunch every morning in Mexico, we have we have 27 different bus routes that we go and get people from their homes or from their daycare centers uh, to ensure that no one you know, is on a bus left you know, more than an hour a day. Um, those are the kind of, we even have when someone starts in Mexico, um, they get a friend at work um, so that, you know, the, with 800 people in the building, you want to make sure that no one's left behind. And those are the little things that create a clear field culture. Um, but more importantly, that's not our stumbling block. Our stumbling block is labor in the field. And the telecommunications industry is really struggling with this and that we have lost, you know, tens of thousands of people out of the telecom market in the last 10 years. Uh, I mean, you know, I was at a, a trade show, you know, a few uh, pre-COVID, uh, and and one of the lead, uh, the chief, T, you know, CTOs of one of the big service provider companies was saying, you know, the average engineer in our industry is a 58-year-old man who's never touched fiber. We have to change that, and uh, there are a lot of aggressive training programs that all of us are undertaking in order to help put that in place. And I'm extremely proud um, of Clearfield College, um, which is a uh, both a online user led online instructor led and most importantly in the field experience training so that we can sit right alongside our customers and make sure they have a good first customer experience have you got have you gotten some traction from that that sort of that field demonstration and study that i think you did with one of your customers and in terms of convincing the tier ones to say hey look i can save you not only can i save you money but i can save you time and i can save you in terms of the the level of uh, sort of installation tech that you have to you have to recruit, right? The skill level that's necessary, absolutely, and okay. and, it's, and it's not um, you know careful from a standpoint of being too um, you know we uh, our first. Uh, strategy, you know, for, first element of, of our strategy moving forward, which I call LEAP, um, the L is to leverage our role in community broadband. And so we don't have to service the needs of someone who has 40 million customers um, in order to significantly grow this company. Um, although I wouldn't say no to the business if it was strategic and it <laughs> did dominate um, our market, because we want to make sure we're not dependent upon a single customer or a single market. Um, but um, absolutely, in a market where labor is so short, 
you know, and, and it's not just the telecom market. I think anyone that I, I speak to will be able to uh, um, tell me horror stories on how they can't, you know, find work, find workers at McDonald's or at the hospital, right? Um, so being able to improve upon that situation certainly resonates strongly uh, with my customers. Um, and uh, where it's long-term, I think uh, we'll introduce some hiccups. Short, uh, short-term, short excuse me, it will introduce some hiccups. Long-term, it'll be very good for Clearfield. Before I shift to international, I had sort of a couple of questions left on the, on the U.S. Um, what is the sort of the latest timetable or, again, inflection point for, say, 5G small cell deployment and back all. Mm -hmm. uh, a long time from now. <laughs> okay. So, so, so you're even seeing the care in the, the wireless carriers sort of kick this can down the road. Yeah, and I mean they're they're so focused on 5G for the phone, um, and right. not, and not the 5G associated with the small cell deployment to deployment and the real opportunity that comes from 5G. Now that said, you know, every home and business we we pass is effectively the, the initiation of 5G um, and being able to use those fibers for back haul and front haul um, and, and put ourselves in a position to leverage every piece of fiber that's out there. So, you know, the, the wireless carriers consistently talk about leveraging the, the fiber that's put in place for both wireline and wireless installation um, and wireless um, uh, performance. So um, I, I don't think I'm not concerned about it being too far away. In fact, there's only so much capex each of these guys are going to spend in a given year. Right. Uh, but because of Clearfield's uh, fiber to anywhere architecture, the uh, the same product that we use for wireline and for cable TV, it can be used in a wireless environment that building block that Clearview cassette. Um, so every piece of experience that we're gaining for fiber to the home and business is going to be applicable for 5G as well. Okay. And then, um, you know, we correct me if I got these numbers wrong, but I think we've seen that in the Ardoff uh, One Awards, the electric utilities got about 1.6 billion, and tribal broadband got about 3 billion. Um, these obviously look like greenfield opportunities to me. Can you can you mm -hmm. talk about sort of where you're at with them, and are you selling direct, or are these through resellers, or how how you're reaching out to this yeah. uh, segment? Right. Uh, we sell both direct as well as through distribution, depending upon what that individual company wants. Um, we're, you know, we're certainly careful if it's a startup, um, so they have the fund, the, the true actually have the funding. Um, but they're typically different distributors. You know, uh, an electrical utility is used to working with a different distributor than a communications uh, you know, provider. And so that means we've been expanding our distribution channel uh, and providing additional programming, you know, for those distributors to be able to turn up. You know, there are 800, you know, uh, electrical utilities in this country and, and 200 of them have reported that they're going to use, uh, they're, they're going to deploy fiber. Um, so they're absolutely our sweet spot. And uh, we have cons uh, concentrated programs within our regional sales teams by which to go after them. Are, is there, you know, because some of these are Greenfield applications and I know for, for Ardoff, sometimes there's requirements in terms of, you know, doing the, the projects correctly and on time, or you have to do a little bit more hand-holding with these type of customers to make sure that they meet the funding requirements? Right. The, uh, um, all of our customers are are welcome to get extensive training from us. Right. And, um, and I think it's um, a standpoint, I wouldn't use it as hand-holding. I would say that, you know, uh, our smart guys are, are, most of them are former um, uh, employee uh, or former customers, or they are uh, personnel out of the military who have deployed fiber in some of the harsh environments in the in the in the globe, and so being able to have you know th that right hand to call and to be able to to work alongside has been instrumental, and uh, I think it's created a network of opportunity for us. Okay, you haven't you haven't seen any customers sort of sort of getting hot water by not meeting project timelines yet. I mean, it's probably a little bit still early in the process, but. No, not at this point. Um, okay. I, I, we have seen, I'd say customers who get in and over their head um, and, <laughs> and uh, but um, but not losing funding. Okay. Uh, wanted to shift, we'll say in North America real quickly. So I wanted to shift over to Canada. Um, my understanding is there's about seven to $8 billion of grant money starting to come into Canada. Um, I'm guessing that you've seen a little bit of organic growth in there because I've seen the international numbers tick up a little bit. Um, I understand that you guys are part of the Fiber One Partnership or Consortium. Um, mm -hmm. Is that a, just sort of an additional channel for you guys? And can you tell us sort of how that's going to work and when sort of the timing of the, the Canadian grant money? 
Mm -hmm. uh, well, the, the Fiber One Consortium is, is um, initiated by SOS, which is our uh, distributor uh, partner, one of our distributor partners um, in Canada, and it, it, it aligns a number of um, uh, providers into kind of a single source. So companies like Prismium, who would provide the fiber and Clearfield, excuse me, Clearfield providing the fiber management to be working together to solve these problems um, and to provide a unified, you know, integrated solution. The, um, uh, all of our distribution, at this point, Clearfield doesn't have direct personnel or, or, or a Canadian employee, but instead uh, manages that, uh, the Canadian market from the U.S., the, um, we've seen that all of our distributors are very close to their customers, and uh, with the exception of the fact that so much of Canada is is serviced by Bell Canada, which would be considered a tier one with a, a barrier to entry, as it's really kind of protected by the incumbents, we're best positioned for the rural markets of, of um, and the rural ILEX the, um, of, Can of Canada, and absolutely have seen um, strong growth in the Canadian market. And I think our, um, because of the harshness, of the harsh environment, and the way our products were designed for harsh environment deployment, um, we actually have, you know, definitely an opportunity for that new funding. The um, uh, nothing specific or different there um, in regard to the funding versus the U.S. program funding. It's it's pr pretty similar in regard to timing. So, so it's probably like 24, 25 event. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then do you think you yeah, have the capacity I, to service, you know, that out of Mexico, Minnesota, or would you be looking to build additional production capacity for that opportunity? Yeah, I, uh, if the opportunity was significant, we would move, um, we would put capacity close to the opportunity. Got it. Okay. All right. So going over to uh, um, Europe. So um, I see that Germany's broadband funding was oversubscribed at $3 billion. I know, uh, you know, from you know, discussions that, that Nestor's, a lot of Nestor's revenue is based in Finland, but they do have some some presence in Germany. Can you talk about sort of the opportunity there and how you plan on to grow Nestor? And again, is this through, you know, reseller opportunities? Is this beefing up the Nestor sales force? And how, how do you, you sort of, and then what are the other opportunities? But I mean, I know UK's got a bunch of, you know, fiber bills going on as well. Can you Can you talk about sort of what your plans are there? Right. The um, well, you know, the the initial reason for Nestor was at, was entirely selfish, right? Let's bring this fiber into Clearfield and be able to to concentrate in the North American market. The um, but we found that you know the 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 group that runs Nestor has got a lot of great ideas about how they can to go into the rest of the European market. You know, because seventy percent of their business today is in Finland, uh, but thirty percent is you know emerging opportunities in different countries, and certainly Germany is one, uh, perhaps our largest and most significant target because it, it's so much like the U.S. Um, it is, and it is behind the U.S. in fiber deployment with less than 5% of homes in Germany connected with fiber. So it's ripe uh, for the opportunity. The, um, uh, we are working through distribution partners the, um, in, in Germany and in other markets, but we do have feet on the street um, in Germany um, and being able to provide both uh, sales and technical resource support, you know, in that region. The um, one of our, uh, I don't talk a lot about our European business yet in that, you know, it's going to be a little bit in development um, because what we want to be able to do is look at what we do best, which is the modular scalability of fiber management and not take a U.S. product, you know, into Germany or into the rest of Europe, but to take the modularity concept and the scalability concept and then develop a cassette, you know, that is integrated into air blown fiber and the kinds of things that are unique to those particular uh, particular markets. You know, the, the core underpinning uh, of Clearfield, the core value of Clearfield is to listen. And so right now we're in a point of discovery. You know, we've attended several um, trade shows. We've talked to uh, a number of different service providers um, who are approaching that marketplace. Um, and we're looking to design an application that is, you know, specifically designed, you know, to address that requirement today. Uh, not the kind of products that were designed, you know, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, um, but really perform Performance-based, success-based products, um, not the build it and you will come kind of products that um, are still on this market. Is, is there a different competitor sort of set over there versus the U.S. or is it is some of the same players? There's some of the same players, but there there certainly is strengths in different places. So okay. um, uh, you see companies like Uber Sooner, um, uh, Hexatronics is a bigger play um, in that market. Um, so you have to adapt to the competition um, wherever you might be. Okay. 
Um, so going back to the, uh, the raise. Um, so we talked a little bit about, you know, your, your production plans. Um, you know, you've got about 16, at least at the end of the fiscal year at about 16, 70 million on your balance sheet, you got about 18 million in the uh, line of credit. Um, you know, roughly, you might raise roughly 110, 120 million. W what can you tell us about where, where you have that money sort of earmarked for? Mm -hmm. uh, well, we, we uh, as I commented earlier, we added $50 million in inventory this year. Um, and that's a good thing. Right? It is, I mean, it puts us in a position of really having what we need when we need it. And remembering that, you know, if there's 100 things on a bomb and I only have 99 of them, I can't recognize the revenue. So um, we're going to continue to make sure we have the right revenue, right inventory in the right place. And we're going to work with our uh, supplier community to do more value add into sub assemblies so that rather than just shipping us piece parts, you know, we're changing the nature of some of our suppliers so they can be more um, integrators, more uh, value added, you know, put more labor into it, um, allowing us to continue to scale our business without additional overhead because we're going to leverage those kinds of, um, you know, solution providers. So, you know, sheet metal operators who not only, you know, the, the small group that I worked with before, you know, didn't have a lights out operation and didn't have the capacity to do some of the initial integration work that we'd like them to do so that we can scale. But that means putting inventory in position, um, sometimes on site with some of those um, suppliers. And so that is a, a cash requirement to grow this business. Got so, so basically, you're going to front run some of the installation, which in turn, in theory, could also speed to market your finished product to your customers? Exactly. And so um, we see the market going, not, not going back to the days of, of 10 to 12 day lead times because that isn't necessary. I mean, we're in a place now where you, you, you they couldn't get the labor that fast. Right. The, um, but, you know, we see, you know, we have outbooked you know, our shipments, you know, for the last two years, the, I um, mean, we, I, this last year we grew 91% and we outbooked revenue by a hundred million dollars. Right. Yeah. And so that is not sustainable. We need to be able to be closer to a one-to-one -one relationship. And so we're going to start to reduce our backlog, which allows us to improve our lead time the, um, by the capacity that we put in place. The, um, and then try to get to a lead time that's closer to maybe, you know, eight to 10 weeks. That allows it maybe about one times, um, one times revenue, one times a quarterly revenue uh, for what the backlog amount is. And that, that creates a, a cadence. The, um, that's more sustainable and continues to uh, give us the position to um, take an order in the season in which it is going to be deployed rather than having people get in line, you know, a year in advance. Okay. And, and I know this is not apples to apples completely, but it seems like in the last three or four quarters, you've been, you know, your revenue has been about running 50 to maybe 58% of your backlog. So if, if this happens, there, there may be a quarter or two in your fiscal 2023, where you may see revenue bump up to 75, 80, 85 percent of your backlog number, is that fair to say? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's the um, it's you know, it's a standpoint in which we need to right size, you know, what we're doing, um, and that you know, we've been. I mean, I've said it before, and I hope I don't offend anyone. We've been running like a like a bat out of hell for two years, and um, we have to be able to, you know, I think the general marketplace. Even AT and T a month ago, you know, screwed up our market a little bit by um, not warning anyone that they were going to take a quarter to reevaluate their capital position. The um, what that's doing is helping the whole industry take a breath and say, okay, how do we better align deployment so that labor and materials are you know, are um, are coming at the same time. Right. Um, and so, you know, I said uh, in, uh, on my year end numbers on the field report in November that, you know, this next quarter, we're going to ship more product than we book for the first time in two years. And that's a really good thing. The, sure. uh, absolutely. absolutely. Well, especially if your competitors, and I won't name them, are still claiming that they have supply chain issues, right? It's only going to make the clear field story easier to sell. Hey, go, going back to it. So if you have your supplier sort of front run some of your assembly what does that impact to margins? Is that going to keep it about the same or are you going to have to pay a little bit more? No, the, we won't do anything. That I'm, the, uh, we want to work with customers who are in a, our suppliers that are going to be at our price or lower. Okay, um, got it. So, 
the right. and there's different ways by which you know to do that depending upon um, using both um, you know, well um, we do a lot of termination in Asia with partners but we do more stuff you know much more um, sheet metal work plastic extrusion work you know in 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 Mexico and other places right. um, I mean as an example I mean the cassette before the pandemic we had a single mold and we did it in the U.S. you know today we have four molds in three different countries you know you know really spreading that out allows us to have a more kind of a, an averaged price that allows us to ensure that we have primary and secondary sources we don't run out of supply you know all that collectively um, is is what creates a, a better engine for us okay got it all right so i've got one question and then i'll turn it over to ben and anybody else who wants to do some q a so um this is, this is kind of a fun one so now that you're you're your stock's been comfortably over a billion dollars. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, with all this new institutional interest that you may also get some a little bit more uh, sell side analyst coverage. I saw that uh, that Cowan was part of one of the uh, the book runners. So does that mean that, you know, we could hopefully see, you know, Cowan start coverage here pretty soon? That would be their past practice. Yeah, good, good to hear. Okay, uh, Ben, uh, you want to take over and see if anybody else, or you, know, you or anybody else in the group, wants to wants to come in? Sure, great, uh, Chris. Good, good questions for Sherry. There, Sherry, really appreciate all those good answers. Um, I I got one question, and I don't see any other questions, so this might be it. Uh, if you do have a question, put it in chat or raise your hand. But I just want to go back to that uninformed comment from Thomas Massey, Representative Thomas Massey. Um, to, to what extent is Clearfield involved with, I, I don't know, educating government uh, or the mm -hmm. lobby at all? Like who, who, who's the check on mm -hmm. people like that who don't know what's going on to ensure that, you know, government funding goes in the right places? Well, the Fiber Broadband Association is a, um, a an organization of all of our industry, right? There are 93 members of the Fiber Broadband Association, premier members, um, that that work collectively to influence you know our market, to influence our government in the right direction. And so they have an effect, they have a very strong lobbying entity within that to work mm -hmm. with the senators and to help them through that process. And so um, we think the work that's been done, especially you know. The, the administration has been very clear, you know, that um, that they prefer fiber, and that they want this bill to be future proof, to be not a, a bill that we've done in the past where we throw money away because we didn't have high enough standards. And so, um, I mean, certainly fixed wireless, certainly the satellite are an improvement to anyone who's stuck with a you know twenty five three service. So we certainly encourage, you know, for-profit businesses to be able to go out and offer those solutions, but they're not the future-proof solution that the government programs were designed to do. Um, and that's really been a, a strong message that has been enforced, you know, by the FCC today. And so you're always going to have... Um, you know, individuals who are going to go off on a tangent, but in general, I've been been very pleased um, with where we're at from a government support program right now. All right, great, Sherry. We're going to wrap it up there. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Looking forward to lots of success, continued success. Well, thank you for the opportunity um, to uh, continue to be able to talk about Clearfield, and uh, um, perhaps we'll we'll talk again next spring. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, for everyone else, if you're watching this replay on YouTube, if you're not yet a story trading member, you can hop on over to the website and join for a seven day free trial. And please do follow us on YouTube, on store, uh, on Twitter at story trading. We're also on Spotify. So thank you very much. We'll continue the collaboration in our community. Have a great day, everyone. Right. Thank you.